Good evening. This is Alexandra. Welcome to Straight Talk, featuring Greg Middleton. We begin a new series titled, The Essence of Man. Mind, body, soul and spirit. Here is Greg. Hi, Alexandra. Good evening, Greg. All is good. Today we start a brand new series. And it's on the essence of mankind. Now, me being one of nearly 8 billion people on the planet, I think I'm qualified to speak about us. So I'd like to start this series in explaining who we are, what we are, and how we got here. We are mind, body, soul, and spirit. Welcome to my straight talk. In our podcast video series, We've attempted to bring you straightforward talk about several subjects regarding faith and belief. Our topics were directly mainly to a Christian body of believers. Not all people believe in God in the same manner, nor do they believe in the same God. There are several gods with a small g, but only one that is supreme over them all. There is but one that stands above all and started all of creation. This God is fully contained within his own. There is nothing outside of Elohim, my creator. He is also Adonai, my master, Jehovah, my Lord God, El Shaddai, my supplier, Shammah, my abiding presence, Ropei, my healer, with several other titles and functions that we've attributed to him. Everything originated out of one divine, supreme God, who is Elohim, the creator of all. Now, of the other names of Jehovah God, Elohim is specifically defined as my creator. Now, you might be thinking, what's in a name? To us, everything. This is because when we hear a name, it automatically triggers an emotional response attached to an impression of what our mind thinks. When you hear the title God, although it is not a name itself, it triggers what we think about the divine being. When you get into the names of God, that takes us to what we were taught or not taught about such a being. To some, It is the most high God above all things, and to others, it is only a spark that is triggered without knowing why. Well, the why is because God created you and placed his spirit in each of us. We only need to activate what was placed in us. Depending on your culture, you may have learned of many names of God that lord over various things that mankind has assimilated into their worship practices. Before we became sophisticated enough to figure out the elements around us or where things appear to be coming from, we attributed what we could not understand to an unnamed God. We did not know who or what this God might be. We only knew that something or someone was apparently in control over things and that we were merely subject to its effects. Things we could clearly see and experience with our own eyes and other senses would include the natural elements such as wind, rain, thunderstorms, snow, sleet, hail, tornadoes, hurricanes, drought, and the like. Now, we knew we did not control such things, but apparently something did. We usually assigned or named the God of each of these things that we did not understand. For example, you might say a rain God, wind God, God of the waters, God of the beasts in the field, God over vegetation and crops, and so on. 
At one point, we naturally feared these gods and pleaded with them to provide our needs or for protection from harm caused by these elements. Many built idols to worship or pay homage to these unknown gods, which did not make Elohim happy. Giving his credit to graven idols made by the hands of man, As we go back over our history, we see how philosophies develop into patterns and groupings that we can identify and put into categories. We learn how we think and process things. We develop a field of science and mathematics around studying such things. We learn to develop formulas and mathematical equations that could be used to duplicate ways of doing and understanding things. Mankind has always been quite resourceful at discovery and analyzing what he discovered. He also learned to record his findings and pass them on to the community at large so others could expound upon what he learned. Now, this mainly applied to the physical world, but attempts were made to apply certain patterns and principles to our behaviors when it came down to what we believe by way of spiritual matters. What I'm explaining to you in a, is a separate track of belief that was developed at the hands of man to assist him in understanding things that he had no real provable answers. God has always been one of those things that man has never fully understood. People of faith took one track while people of science took another track. The world of scientific proof would be totally different from the world of faith in an unseen God. Science wants verifiable proof, while faith believes without it. Now this chasm is heart baked into mankind from back in our early history. It appears to be growing even farther apart rather than closing. This is not very surprising because most things in this world seem to be divided into their various camps of likenesses and similarities. The rich band together and create their communities. The poor have no option but to be grouped together, ousted by the rich. People of faith group together in communities of similar belief, many times keeping away from those who believe differently. Now, if you look out today, you might notice that the most segregated day of the week is during our times of worship. All the various camps assemble and worship according to their beliefs. They meet separately and can is usually confined to their groupings. There is only one way to God. But Steve's faith is unique because it's really not about that. There's no one, one way to heaven, no one way to paradise. It's like television. Now it's over 800 channels of cable and they're all pretty entertaining. So I'm pretty sure, man, that to get to heaven, there's gotta be more than one route. And cause somebody watching another channel or taking another channel than you, they still getting entertained and they probably still getting to heaven. This isn't just talk. Steve lives by these words. He has three sons. Two of them, he gave them Christian names like Broderick, and one of them, he gave a Muslim name, Ali, as a sign of respect and appreciation for the Muslim religion and the Muslim culture. I named him Ali because I knew, I knew then. That he I might knew, be different. I knew. And you have no problems with it. No, because when you come here, you understand Islam is a religion of peace. Why you got a problem with peace? Christians and Muslim rally group together for worship. 
Muslims and Jews rarely meet to worship their God. The same is true about most other world-renowned religions. As you might expect, human beings have carved this large planet into our own slices of the pie that we feel comfortable associating with, while all but ignoring those who live on the other side of the tracks. We didn't even talk about the world of business yet, which is so extremely competitive. Tribes, tribalism, territory, land, and proprietary rights divide us into groupings beyond mere faith and belief. Such lines are drawn along financial and proprietary lines in addition to the ones of faith and belief, or disbelief. Our world is one big ball of individual cults and groupings. Now this brings me to my title for this initial episode regarding the essence of man. What are we? Who are we? Why are we? And how did we become us? Since I'm a Christian by faith, I can only tell you things that my Lord has somehow revealed to me. That knowledge would be contained in our holy scriptures for reference, but not everyone takes the time to read, study, or practice the fundamentals that are mutually accepted among their groups. Some only believe by declaration, meaning there is nothing behind their stated words. No practice, no worship, no sacrifice, no acts, nor deeds. Now, the parable of the sower would give you a good analogy of these various kinds of believers, and which is listed in Matthew 13. You can read that separately when you have the time, or right now, I'll wait for you. I won't be going anywhere anytime soon. As I was contemplating how to approach such a subject, I wondered what would be the most impactful, what would be the most convincing, informative, and believable. Although I personally love the printed scriptures and what they reveal, as mentioned, not everyone goes to that well to take a drink. You can lead a horse to water, but that horse must take the drink to quench his own thirst. Christ said that he is the living waters of which we can drink and never be thirsty again. Now, I could explain what he meant by that, but only the faithful would understand it. My complaint about the physical church of today is that only saved people tend to go there. Ironically, the ones who are not saved rarely step a foot inside the sanctuary of God. So why preach to the choir? I think a better approach would be to speak directly to the skeptics. Now, as a former skeptic myself, that shouldn't be a hard role for me to play because I have been there and done that. So, let us start this series about the essence of man with a few questions. Who are we? What are we? Why are we? And how did we get here? Now, I'll try to make this rather brief because there's a lot of ground to cover. So let's start with who are we? We are sentient beings embodying several aspects rolled into one body. Now, I'll leave the science to the scientists, but we are both spirit beings and carnal beings with two separate forms of existence living currently in one shell. Your soul and spirit are eternal and came directly from Elohim, the Creator. It is not a physical essence, but pure spirit. It was mirrored in the likeness and the image of God's likeness as a divine spirit being. We are a part of what God is, the whole. Even though everyone has a soul and spirit, not all realize this to be fact. 
Thereby, they do not live accordingly. Since they do not believe in the spirit, they are merely sleepwalking through this life, meandering through time until it's over. At that point, the soul and spirit will be released back into the spiritual realm where there is judgment as to what was learned, developed, gained, and the like. And trees that do not bear fruit are simply discarded and cast into the fire. That is not what unbelievers want to hear, but a day of reckoning will come, so get ready. In addition to our spirit, we're also carnal or physical beings. God threw the breath of life into our bodies, making us walking, breathing, and living flesh with a few operational systems to help us navigate our way through the world of form. We use our five senses to help us navigate through the world, but there are several other senses that are not as well known. They are rarely used because they only come out in instances of extreme tension. Now we have things such as premonition, the ability to leave our bodies temporarily and return. We can understand unspoken languages and other things that I don't think I'm allowed to mention because they're mainly used by the occult, such as in witchcraft or devil worshippers and the like. Your physical body is a housing for your soul and spirit and your natural being that is here to learn, to grow, develop, and mature spiritually. The body is your vehicle that you may use or misuse to achieve your divine mission upon the earth. This also covers what we are because you are mind, body, soul, and spirit all wrapped into one. Next, why are we here? God created you for his purposes in order to achieve his divine reason for creating you. You're not just another ant in a huge ant colony, but a sentient being made in the likeness of God to be like him and to learn and develop his essences. There are many fruits on the tree, but not all of them are good. Some will have rotten spots. Some will become infected by worms or bacteria or other harmful elements that would corrupt the fruit. Now those corrupted fruit will usually fall to the ground and rot while the good fruit will be consumed, lifted up and returned back to the maker at the appointed time. Now there is a time to be born and a time to die. We're not immortal while living in these bodies of flesh. God appoints the time and the venues of our birth to coincide with his divine will and plan for us to prosper, giving us hope and a future with him throughout eternity. And finally, I want to cover how we became us. As mentioned, God is the potter. He makes every pot there is and puts in the pot what he knows they need to achieve what he ultimately has in mind for them. God wants us to be like him and to have what he has to offer to us. Now we can reject God even though we do not even own our own selves. The bodies we live in belong to Elohim. We have the free will to even curse God, but should God decide to pull his hand of life out of our mortal bodies? they will return to the dirt from which they came. Now, as we continue with this series regarding the essence of man, I hope to cover more about our nature, about why we do things as we do, and why we don't do things that God would like to see us do. We are somewhat defined by nature, but in cases, some cases, that could be a strength showing your desire to be like God, having certain powers and abilities. However, that feeling of pride must be tamed and made humble because there is only one divine God. Two wolves cannot rule in this pasture. 
Satan tried that and see what happened to him. A split occurred in the heavenly abode, losing one third of the spiritual kingdom during the fall. Even though this happened in the heavenly abode, it directly impacted us, who are sentient mortal beings currently assigned to a confined body with a short expiration date. Our souls and spirits are eternal. Yet our temporary beings here on the earth only have a short time to achieve God's mission for us. Once you understand how significant life and being here is on the earth and what you need to be doing to prepare for eternity, perhaps you might want to consider reversing your priorities. We spend so much of our waking moments worrying about things of the earth and very little time securing our pathways through eternity. Your time here comparatively is not even the bat of an eye to God, but it carries consequences. Now God will answer all your questions should you want to know more. He tells us in Matthew to ask, seek, and knock. He also says that my people don't have because they don't ask. That's in James 4. So here's my final verdict for this beginning episode. You are a triune being of sorts. You are fully human that has a mind that often gets you in trouble when it deviates from God. Your soul and spirit are directly from God. The only control you have is to allow the Lord to teach you, to develop you, and to return your soul and spirit back to Him in better condition than when it started. Now, you were once a child and thought as a child. But once you became older, you expected to act older and more matured in the ways of God. God is not only watching over you, but he is also actually having his being through you while you are here on the earth. Now keep that thought in mind as you go about your daily business of living life on planet earth for just a brief slice of time. To almighty God be the glory. Fila. Book of Revelation, uh-huh. chapter 7, verses 16 and 17. Yes, sir. They shall hunger no more, neither shall they thirst any more. Preach, preach up. For God shall wipe away, yes, sir, every tear from their eye. Yes, sir. Get ready for the revolution. Come on. Come on. What you say? Come on. Jesus is the true son, the second in the trinity, I know you're feeling him.